On the significant date of October 21st, 1600, a historic event unfolded known as the Battle of Sekigahara. Shimazu Toyohisa, a brave warrior, took part in this battle, engaging valiantly and managing to vanquish a number of enemy soldiers. At the same time, Fukushima Masanori fought with immense courage against the Shimazu army, but found it extremely challenging to withstand their relentless and ferocious attacks. Their need for aid became urgent, and they sought assistance from Ino Masa, an esteemed general of the Eastern Army. Thankfully, Naomasa responded promptly and agreed to join the fight, offering a glimmer of hope in the midst of battle. Toyohisa fought valiantly, displaying remarkable courage and determination until his very last moments on the battlefield. He urged Shimazu Yoshihiro, the general of the Western Army, to make a hasty retreat back to Satsuma for safety. The general refused to go back at first, claiming that he was going to fight alongside him, but Toyohisa insisted and the general had no choice but to go back. As Naomasa's army pressed forward, Toyohisa and his forces engaged them, hoping to buy valuable time for Yoshihiro's escape. In a daring charge, Toyohisa fought with all his might, inflicting heavy casualties and damages upon the opposing forces. However, he was ultimately confronted by Naomasa, who asks his men to defend him as Toyohisa advances to attack him and gets tragically pierced by multiple spears from Naomasa's men. Yet, in a final act of defiance, Toyohisa managed to draw a firearm and shoot Naomasa, causing him to fall from his horse. This courageous action bought his troops a chance to retreat from the relentless battlefield. Despite the severity of his injuries, Toyohisa continued to yell, urging Naomasa to leave his head as Naomasa's men pick him up and retreat from battle, showcasing his unwavering spirit and commitment. Bearing grievous injuries, Toyohisa embarked on a challenging journey towards Satsuma. He follows a path in the forest and is very keen on making it back home. However, in a sudden and unexpected turn of events, he found himself transported to a seemingly endless corridor adorned with numerous doors. A man sat at a desk, holding a newspaper and a cigarette in his mouth, carefully examining Toyohisa's dossier. This mysterious setting left Toyohisa bewildered, prompting questions about his whereabouts and the identity of the man. Swiftly, the man made notations in Toyohisa's file, and Toyohisa was drawn into one of the enigmatic doors. Upon awakening, Toyohisa discovered himself in a completely unfamiliar realm, where he was discovered by two elves named Mark and Marsha. Recognizing him as a drifter, they kindly offered to escort him to an abandoned castle, a gesture of kindness Toyohisa deeply appreciated. As they approached the castle, they talked about how nobody should know that they came towards the castle. Their path was interrupted by another drifter, Nasu Sukataka Yoichi, who issued a stern warning for them to halt. He threatened harm if they persisted in their journey. Sensing the urgency of Toyohisa's condition and acknowledging him as a fellow drifter, Mark and Marsha explained the critical situation. Yoichi, comprehending the gravity of Toyohisa's condition, urged the elves to leave him and swiftly depart, which they did hastily. Meanwhile, from the ruins, Oda Nobunaga, another drifter, inquired about the unfolding events, and Yoichi provided insight into Toyohisa's likely origins from Japan and his current wounded state. They collectively decided to prioritize tending to Toyohisa's injuries and evaluating his chances of survival, demonstrating compassion amidst the chaos of their newfound reality. Upon regaining consciousness, Toyohisa found himself face to face with Nobunaga, prompting him to instinctively draw his sword and seek answers about Nobunaga's identity. Similarly, Nobunaga expressed curiosity about Toyohisa's origins and the era from which he hailed. Toyohisa, observant of the Moku Crest, contemplated if Nobunaga belonged to the Oda clan, a suspicion confirmed by Nobunaga himself. This revelation left Toyohisa in disbelief, as he cited Nobunaga's supposed demise over 18 years ago. Tensions escalated momentarily, but Yoichi intervened, diffusing the situation and symbolically instructing Nobunaga and Toyohisa to pluck feathers conveying a gesture of peace and understanding. Amidst this encounter, Toyohisa reiterated his belief in Nobunaga's long-past demise, surprising Nobunaga, who clarified that he had been transported to this world merely six months prior, following the events at Honuji. He is perplexed to hear that people believe that he actually died. Yoichi further corroborated this revelation, identifying himself as Nasu Sukataka Yoichi from 400 years past, causing Toyohisa to vehemently reject this bewildering truth. In the ensuing conversation, Toyohisa disclosed his affiliation with the Shimazu clan, which Nobunaga and Yoichi recognized as a minor provincial clan from Kyushu. As they exchanged their unique perspectives and insights, they all recounted encountering the enigmatic man within the stone passage, adorned with multiple doors upon departing from Sekigahara. This revelation left Nobunaga deep in contemplation, reflecting on the altered course of history, including the tragic demise of his son, while Yoichi expressed astonishment at the fall of the Minamoto clan 
and the subsequent destruction of the Kamakura Shogunate. Beyond this realm, Omenu, a young girl, stood watch, observing the unfolding events and informing Abe Noharuakira of the presence of three drifters. Abe Noharuakira deemed them a potential threat, prompting immediate action as their army prepared to mobilize and confront this newfound enigma. Kafedo, a vigilant onlooker, hastily approached Abe no Haruakira, informing him of the ongoing tumultuous altercation between two seasoned drifters. Hannibal, a strategic maestro, and Scipio, a formidable opponent, were embroiled in a heated dispute. The disagreement stemmed from Hannibal accusing Scipio of brazenly emulating his well-crafted strategies, going so far as to label him a thieving imitator. Abe no Haruakira, a witness to this intense clash of wills, immediately and urgently directed Kafeto to intervene, and put a halt to their escalating quarrel. Meanwhile, in a different part of this dynamic landscape, Shara, a senior sibling to the two elves who rescued Toyohisa, sternly admonished Mark and Marsha with a voice of reason and caution for their audacious foray into the perilous confines of the abandoned castle. She took the opportunity to emphasize the inherent dangers associated with meddling in the affairs of the drifters. Simultaneously, Aram, a commanding figure, led a resolute army on a march towards the vulnerable elves' village. Within the desolate castle, Toyohisa and Nobunaga were roused from their slumber, their senses awakened by the telltale scent of imminent battle in the air. Nobunaga, the keen observer, noticed a distant blaze, swiftly realizing it emanated from the beleaguered elves' village, likely under the ruthless attack of merciless bandits. He clarified the circumstance further, explaining that the elves had sought refuge for Toyohisa among them. Instantly, Toyohisa felt an overpowering compulsion to sprint towards the village, driven by an indomitable sense of purpose and a resolute determination to make a difference. Despite his lack of familiarity with his current surroundings, he expressed unwavering determination to forge ahead. Nobunaga and Yoichi, impressed and inspired by Toyohisa's valor, made a unanimous decision to follow his courageous lead. During their adrenaline-fueled pursuit, Toyohisa playfully teased Nobunaga about his pace, a pace affected by his age of 50. Curiously, Yoichi, the youngest among them, inquired about Toyohisa's age, revealing his own youthful age of 19. As they progressed, they stumbled upon Mark and Marcia, desperately fleeing from menacing soldiers. Nobunaga, with swift precision, neutralized one of the pursuers, while Toyohisa, displaying exceptional skill, dealt with two more. Confronted by a soldier who spoke an incomprehensible language, Toyohisa resolutely conveyed that without understanding Japanese, the soldier's fate was tragically sealed, leading to the inevitable dispatch. Turning to the elves, Toyohisa acknowledged their timely rescue and emphasized a reciprocal duty to protect them from harm. Nobunaga, with his sharp wit, humorously noted the language barrier, prompting Toyohisa to engage in a brief and necessary Japanese language tutorial with the elves. Observing the soldier's movements, Nobunaga, ever the strategist, realized that they were more than mere bandits and harbored aspirations to conquer the village for their cause. Abe no Haruakira, a perceptive observer, overheard this intention and expressed surprise at Nobunaga's use of the term claim rather than help or take back. He recognized it as a reflection of their inherent nature and their relentless desire to conquer and expand their territories. Meanwhile, at the elves' village, Aram, a figure of cruelty and malevolence, orchestrated a terrifying display of power and dominance. He organized the elves, sternly reminding them of the long-standing prohibition against venturing into the forest and associating with drifters. Shara, a compassionate soul, raised valid concerns about the necessity of entering the forest for firewood and hunting, emphasizing the dire circumstances the elves faced due to the ruthless abduction of their women. Aram, embodying cruelty and callousness, confirmed the dire consequences of their actions and callously ordered the ruthless execution of the elves and other demi-human inhabitants, including dwarves and hobbits. In a brutal and heart-wrenching assault, they began massacring the helpless elves. Aram, unflinchingly cruel, justified this heinous atrocity, stating that they were permitted to kill up to 50% of the village's inhabitants. Soon, news arrived of a devastating fire ravaging the wheat field. In a strategic response, Nobunaga and Yoichi, recognizing the precariousness of the situation, ignited the fields. They sought to demonstrate the harsh reality that those lacking dignity could survive with food, and conversely, those lacking food could endure hunger with dignity. However, those unfortunate souls deprived of both would desperately cling to anything within their reach for a chance at survival. Toyohisa, embodying the spirit of a warrior and fueled by righteous fury, charged into battle, confronting the soldiers with unmatched ferocity. He faced Aram, his nemesis, and vowed to claim not just his head, but his very life in the name of justice. Mark and Marsha, grateful for Toyohisa's intervention, 
arrived on the scene and narrated the sequence of events that had unfolded. Witnessing the devastation and loss among the elves, Toyohisa's fury intensified, propelling him into an intense skirmish with Aram, leaving the latter severely injured and incapacitated. Toyohisa, propelled by a potent mix of vengeance and justice, used his katana sheath to deliver a relentless and brutal assault on Aram, barely leaving him alive. Subsequently, Toyohisa offered a sword to the grief-stricken elves, urging them to avenge their fallen brethren and defeat Aram. Initially hesitant, the elves eventually steeled themselves, taking up arms and vowing to exact retribution on Aram for his despicable deeds. Meanwhile, Yoichi demonstrated his prowess by eliminating the fleeing soldiers, and Nobunaga urged Toyohisa to join him and Yoichi, signifying their unity and collective efforts in the face of adversity. On a separate front, Murasaki, an intellectual and strategist, immersed himself in a newspaper article detailing the triumphant capture of the village by the drifters. Easy, a formidable adversary, approached him, confidently asserting her conviction in overcoming his efforts. However, Murasaki remained resolute, determined to right the wrongs and ensure justice prevailed. He dismissed her provocations and insisted that the wrongs must be set right. Annoyed by his unwavering resolve, Easy revealed a grim truth. The Black King had initiated a northern invasion, highlighting the formidable challenge posed by the ends. Undeterred, Murasaki vowed to rise to the occasion and confront this new threat head-on. In a different setting, Ominu, a loyal aide, updated Abe no Haruakira on the current state of affairs. She informed him about the drifter's successful seizure of the village and expressed a fervent desire to take it back. However, Abe no Haruakira, displaying keen foresight and caution, cautioned her against rash actions, emphasizing the inherent danger posed by the ongoing invasion by the ends. He urged her to exercise caution and prioritize the safety of all involved. Abe no Haruakira, a thoughtful strategist, felt a growing surge of worry as he contemplated the impending threat posed by the Black King. Despite the Carnid's warriors attempting to assuage his concerns by pointing to the strength of their seemingly impregnable wall, Abe's insightful analysis led him to a grim realization. The defenses would likely falter within a mere two days. With a determined resolve to salvage the situation, he made the decision to venture out, accompanied by Cafedo, hoping to align the two seasoned drifters, Hannibal and Scipio, to lead their army and potentially save their imperiled country. Efforts to convince the Carniades warriors to let Scipio and Hannibal take the lead were met with mockery and resolute refusal. The warriors didn't like the idea of them being led by drifters. The situation took an unexpected and somewhat embarrassing turn when Hannibal, faced with derision, lost control over his bladder and let out its content, further exacerbating their status as a laughingstock. Witnessing this, Scipio, filled with a sense of indignation, began to elucidate Hannibal Barca's fearsome reputation as a legendary military commander. Abe, displaying his characteristic wisdom, swiftly intervened, urging them to prepare for escape, recognizing the urgency of fleeing before the imminent assault by the Black King's formidable forces. The telltale signs of magical disturbance heightened Abe's concerns, leading him to the conclusion that the Black King was already present in their vicinity. Taking charge, Abe rallied a formidable army, urging his troops to engage the foe and prepare for the inevitable clash. The Black King, a formidable adversary, commanded his own forces, directing prominent historical figures like Hijikata Toshizo, Joan of Arc, and Anastasia Romanova to join the assault. Abe engaged in a brief but intense exchange with Minamoto no Yoshitsune, the outcome of which highlighted Yoshitsune's allegiance to personal interest, rather than a specific faction, showcasing his independent and enigmatic nature. In the midst of the chaos and escalating tensions, an unexpected anomaly disrupted the battlefield. A mysterious door materialized in the sky, revealing a World War II Japanese airplane piloted by Kano Naoshi. Naoshi, bewildered by the unfamiliar setting and the surreal sight of people riding dragons, embarked on a mission to confront the invaders and make sense of the situation. Toshizo, Joan, and Anastasia, fueled by their historical prowess and a sense of purpose, breached the walls with ease, wreaking havoc and sowing destruction wherever they went. Witnessing the devastation and drawing a painful parallel parallel to the bombings in Japan, now she was consumed by a potent mix of anger and determination. Escaping the chaos alongside Scipio and Hannibal, Abe sought out Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. He proposed the idea of them leading an army against the Black King, emphasizing the possibility of victory through unity with the Samurais. Their escape was fraught with challenges but the indomitable duo of Butch and Sundance utilized their firepower with precision, eliminating any opposition they encountered. Hannibal, displaying his characteristic ambition and foresight, expressed a desire to wield the powerful Gatling gun against Rome. Their journey saw them face a formidable dragon, a symbol of the chaos that had engulfed the realm. However, now she arrived in the nick of time, skillfully dispatching the beast with his airplane and proceeding to vanquish other dragons that threatened their path. Abe felt a surge of relief, realizing that now she was a drifter, 
and not aligned with the ends. With a renewed sense of purpose and determination, he vowed to rectify the chaos left in the wake of the Black King's advance, ensuring that justice would prevail in the end. Simultaneously, amidst the escalating conflict, the Black King, a figure of considerable power and influence, dispatched his emissary, a loyal bird, to locate the escaped drifters and convey the message that their blood must be spilled to quell the rebellion. The tension was palpable as the fate of the drifters hung in the balance. Elsewhere, Olminu, a loyal aide, grappled with uncertainty as she had lost contact with Abe. The situation seemed dire and unclear, leaving her at a crossroads. In a moment of unexpected revelation, Yoichi and Nobunaga, two steadfast drifters, materialized before her, and Toyohisa emerged from the shadows. Suspicion and tension hung in the air, prompting Omainu to fear for her safety. A mysterious and enigmatic entity, a harbinger of doom, made its presence known, fueling their apprehensions. Olminu hesitantly explained her affiliation with the Octobrist organization and her mission to observe and unite the drifters against the ends. However, skepticism persisted among the trio and they remained unconvinced, their gaze unwavering and their resolve unyielding. Despite her attempts to shed light on the larger purpose behind their arrival in this enigmatic world, the three drifters were steadfast in their apathy, indifferent to the fate of this mysterious realm and the ongoing struggle between drifters and ends. Easy, a confident representative of the ends, confidently strode into Murasaki's domain, taunting him with her belief in the inevitable triumph of the ends over the drifters. To her surprise, she found Murasaki absent, taking a lunch break and leaving her alone to contemplate the situation and the unfolding events. Meanwhile, in the midst of the unfolding chaos, Toyohisa and his comrades took meticulous precautions to ensure Olminu's safety. They securely bound her with ropes, all the while engaging in a thoughtful and in-depth conversation that delved into the intricacies defining the relentless conflict between the enigmatic drifters and the nefarious ends. Olminu, despite her captive status, willingly shed light on her enigmatic organization, the Octobrist, unraveling its crucial role in this supernatural struggle. She passionately emphasized the dire need for cooperation in the face of the ever-looming threat posed by the destructive forces of the ends. Her eyes flickered with determination as she painted a vivid picture of these monstrous ends, describing them as inhuman aberrations driven by a relentless and insatiable desire to mercilessly slaughter humanity. She contrasted this starkly with the drifters, individuals who, despite their otherworldly circumstances, still clung to shreds of their lost humanity. As Olminu spoke, the urgency of their situation became even more apparent. She explained the typical modus operandi of her octobrist organization, forging alliances with kings and nobles, and entrusting drifters with the critical task of leading their armies against the otherworldly menace. However, Nobunaga, ever the strategist and visionary, dismissively waved aside this traditional approach. In its place, he proposed a daring and revolutionary strategy, one that involved the drifters taking direct control over the very fabric of the state they found themselves in. In this new vision, Toyohisa would emerge as the undisputed leader, a decision made out of necessity to combat the rapidly advancing ends, especially the formidable and mysterious Black King who stood at the helm of their malevolent forces. The stakes were higher than ever, and a bold, unorthodox approach seemed to be the only path forward in the battle to save their world. On the opposing side, Grigori Rasputin reported to the Black King, confirming the successful takeover of Carniads. The Black King, displaying a twisted sense of compassion, chose to heal the injured among their ranks, referring to them as his brethren. He declared the fall of the Northern Wall and announced his intent to save the Demi-Humans while plotting the destruction of humanity. He urged the Ends to focus their efforts on eliminating the Drifters, identifying them as their primary enemy. In a different corner of this tumultuous world, Kano Naoshi faced a challenging situation as his plane malfunctioned, leading to a rough landing. Beastmen emerged on the scene, sparking Naoshi's excitement for an impending battle, showcasing his unwavering spirit even in the face of adversity. Meanwhile, the elves deliberated the consequences of killing a knight and feared execution. Yoichi attempted to communicate with them, urging them to join their cause, but language barriers posed a significant challenge. Olminu revealed the existence of language charms provided by Abe, enabling instant fluency, bringing a sense of relief to Yoichi, who had struggled to communicate effectively. Nobunaga lightened the atmosphere with humor, seeking essential information about the elves from Olminu. Olminu narrated the elves' tragic history of subjugation and defeat by humans decades ago underscoring their pride and longevity as a people. This revelation heightened Nobunaga's determination to guide them toward reclaiming their freedom and pride. A clash between Toyohisa and Nobunaga ensued, resembling a familial dispute, but Shara intervened, recognizing the imminent threat posed by the approaching human army from Orte. The revelation of Orte's impending attack, combined with the elves' unique age and history, spurred contemplation and discussion among the group. Olminu clarified Orte's desire for dominance and urged the drifters to determine their course of action. Toyohisa 
Kisa, displaying empathy and strategic thinking, opted to allow the elves and their allies into the village, preparing for the inevitable clash with Orte's approaching forces. Orte's formidable army, a formidable force consisting of 200 seasoned warriors, advanced with unwavering confidence towards the village they had targeted. However, as they drew closer to the village, a sense of unease began to settle upon the ranks. The eerie silence that enveloped the surroundings was unnerving to say the least. There were no sounds of bustling life, no livestock grazing in the fields, and no children's laughter echoing through the air. It was as though the village had been abruptly and mysteriously deserted, leaving Orte's soldiers bewildered and uncertain about their next course of action. With their initial confidence giving way to doubt, the soldiers exchanged perplexed glances and muttered amongst themselves, trying to decipher the enigma that had befallen the village. The soldiers, bewildered by the absence of any villagers and the disturbing discovery of the well filled with filth, hastily informed their commander. Perplexed, the commander learned that the soil beneath the toilets had been dug up and was missing, leaving them at a loss for explanations. At the abandoned castle, Toyohisa strategizes their next move, firmly declaring their intention to strike tonight. However, the elves seemed more focused on crafting bows than donning armor and wielding swords. In the aftermath of a gruesome battle, where Toyohisa had slain the soldiers and buried their heads, Nobunaga repurposed the bodies for saltpeter, tossing them into a pit filled with grass, soil, feces, and urine. Nobunaga then discussed securing sulfur with Olmenu, planning to pay for it once they had taken control of multiple states. Amidst the preparations, Yoichi marveled at the elves' swift archery progress, showcasing his own prowess by splitting arrows with precision. Encouraged by their progress, the group readied for their imminent assault on the village, aiming to liberate the oppressed elves and confront the lord in his castle. Toyohisa revealed the lord's vile practice of taking elf women during their once-a-year reproduction cycle, a scheme aimed at driving them to extinction. With determination fueling their spirits, they initiated the assault on the village, Toyohisa engaging the soldiers up close while Nobunaga's group set the village ablaze. Recognizing the soldiers as likely third-rate due to Orte being at war, Nobunaga calculated the psychological impact of their actions, instilling fear in a significant portion of the enemy. Coded arrows and strategic contamination drove the soldiers to desperation, exposing the village as a trap meticulously set by the drifters. In the heat of the battle, Toyohisa emerged as a force to be reckoned with. Personal dispatching the commander and causing the remainder of the enemy forces to flee in terror. The victorious elves celebrated, but Toyohisa reminded them of their objective, the castle. Despite lacking a concrete plan, Toyohisa's audacity and determination drove them forward. Nobunaga, always the tactician, disguised the group as Orte soldiers, setting the stage for their infiltration. As the fleeing soldiers desperately attempted to evade their relentless pursuers, they soon found themselves ensnared in a treacherous web of deadly traps, each one meticulously placed by Yoichi and his vigilant group of drifters. There was no respite, no chance for the soldiers to escape unscathed. The traps, cunningly designed and ruthlessly executed, ensured that every step taken in desperation led to injury or worse. Meanwhile, the lord of the castle, unaware of the unfolding events outside, was entirely oblivious to the fact that disguised drifters had infiltrated his stronghold. With an air of confidence and self-assuredness, he granted them entry, unknowingly welcoming the very individuals who would soon challenge his reign. Upon their confrontation, Toyohisa, his eyes ablaze with righteous fury, demanded to know the whereabouts of the captive women, the innocent souls subjected to unspeakable torment within the castle's grim confines. The Lord, taken by surprise, hesitated for a moment before pointing a trembling finger toward the ominous tower, where the imprisoned women languished in unspeakable suffering. The sight that met their eyes in that accursed tower was nothing short of a descent into hell itself. The captive women, frail and terror-stricken, bore the scars of the horrendous treatment inflicted upon them. Their harrowing plight fueled Toyohisa's righteous wrath igniting a fierce determination to bring retribution to those responsible for such heinous acts. Toyohisa's eyes blazed with fury as he bore witness to the appalling treatment of the captive elf women. Their suffering had ignited a flame within him, a fierce determination to bring down retribution upon those who had caused such anguish. The group prepared for the final assault on the castle, their hearts fueled by the need to end this injustice. In the midst of the ongoing events, Nobunaga, the astute strategist, issued a clear directive to the elven contingent. He urged them to meticulously comb through the castle, searching for a diverse array of documents that could offer insights into the enigmatic Orte. Olminu, finding herself genuinely surprised by the successful conquest of the castle, engaged Nobunaga in conversation. Her surprise was accentuated by the presence of a large portrait of Adolf Hitler within the premises, prompting Nobunaga to express curiosity about this perplexing figure. Olminu took it upon herself to elucidate Hitler's historical significance, explaining that he was the progenitor of Orte, the very entity they were struggling to categorize as either drifters or ends. 
Hitler's emergence six decades ago had incited a rebellion, an uprising orchestrated through impassioned speeches that won the hearts of the populace. The rebellion culminated in the formation of Orte. However, the dark chapter concluded tragically with Hitler's suicide. Soon after, distressing news arrived regarding Toyohisa's actions, as he had dragged out captured soldiers with the intent to execute them. Sensing the brutality that might befall the women at the hands of these soldiers, Nobunaga swiftly intervened. He implored Toyohisa to relinquish this grim task, asserting that it was his own responsibility. With Nobunaga's timely intervention, the soldiers met their end at the hands of the elves, with the exception of one vehement man who professed his innocence and insisted that he had not harmed the women. He had merely been transferred there. In the aftermath of this tragic incident, the surviving female elves were safely returned to their respective villages, carrying with them the haunting tale of what had transpired. Nobunaga, with his deep-seated sense of justice, took it upon himself to correspond with each village. In these carefully crafted letters, he presented the villages with a crucial choice, the option for freedom. He highlighted the palpable limitations of Orte, sparking a fervor that triggered revolts among the elven villages, ultimately liberating them from the oppressive clutches of Orte. Meanwhile, Easy, upon learning of the Black King's triumph, was incensed to discover that the Drifters had orchestrated the emancipation of the elves. The tides of fate were turning, and the momentum was shifting against Orte. Simultaneously, Saint-Germy, a prominent and influential aristocrat holding a significant share of the Orte Empire, received distressing tidings about their territorial losses. Acutely aware of the nation's imminent demise, Saint-Germy chose a pivotal course of action. He initiated a crucial visit to the Ort leaders, attempting to impress upon them the gravity of their predicament. During this visit, he revealed the grim news of the obliteration of their naval fleet, a vital blow to their already strained supply lines in the Western Front dealt cunningly by the merchant guild of Gu Binan, led by the tactically adept Yamaguchi Tamon. Saint-Germy endeavored to sound the alarm regarding the looming elven threat, but the leaders failed to grasp the magnitude of the situation, further cementing his conviction that the nation's fate was irrevocably sealed. In another corner of this vast realm, elves from diverse villages rallied under Shara's banner, expressing a fervent desire to align themselves with the cause. Nobunaga, however, found himself contending with a sense of frustration due to Toyohisa's decision to implement a village head council system. He lamented the missed opportunity of a gradual ascent to power and the possibility of ascending to the throne. Toyohisa, with his nuanced understanding of strategies, endeavored to reason with Nobunaga, emphasizing the complexities of human intentions. Despite Nobunaga's exceptional ability to discern actions, reading hearts remained beyond his purview. Toyohisa predicted a future where the elves, despite their current alignment, might eventually wield their bows against them. Nobunaga, unwavering in his determination, remained resolute in his ambition to see Toyohisa crowned as a king. Shara, a key figure in this unfolding drama, shared her concerns with Nobunaga. She revealed the elves' inability to replicate the intricacies of the rifles, suggesting that seeking assistance from the dwarves, known for their unparalleled craftsmanship, might hold the key to success. Meanwhile, Yoichi, known for his formidable skills, initiated training sessions for the elves. The elves were awe-inspired by Yoichi's dedication and prowess, despite their light-hearted comments about his appearance. To dispel any misconceptions, Yoichi humbly revealed that he was the least attractive among his eleven brothers in the Nasu clan. Toyohisa, meanwhile, showcased his remarkable swordsmanship, urging the elves to channel all their strength into a single powerful slash. As tension pervaded the air, an uncanny premonition swept through the group, heralding the arrival of two formidable figures, Joan of Arc and Jili de Reis. The drifters, Toyohisa, Yoichi, and Nobunaga, are seen sitting in the old castle with Olminu, and they all claim that something is coming as they say they are having an eerie feeling. Toyohisa says he smells Sekigahara, which is the smell of a bloody battle. Joan of Arc and Gilles de Rai, two legendary figures from the past, embarked on an unexpected adventure in a mystical world filled with elves and warriors from different eras. Their mission, to confront and challenge these enigmatic beings in a fierce battle. Joan, a fearless warrior, led the charge against the elves her sword gleaming in the pale sunlight. Her voice echoed through the forest as she called upon the Drifters, a group of extraordinary individuals summoned to this world. Among them was Toyohisa, a skilled and battle-hardened samurai. As the Drifters arrived on the scene, Joan made a bold decision to engage Toyohisa in combat. She believed that defeating him would showcase her immense power. However, her actions hinted at her inexperience, and Toyohisa sensed her desire for recognition. Meanwhile, Ominu, a member of the Drifters with the ability to create protective barriers, 
rushed to Toyohisa's aid. She erected sturdy walls to shield him from Joan's fiery onslaught. Grateful for her intervention, Toyohisa acknowledged Joan's formidable strength while also perceiving her as a newcomer eager to prove herself. Olminu assured Toyohisa that she could create more protective barriers. In response, he instructed her to follow his lead and then retreat into the safety of the forest. The battle continued to intensify as Gilles de Reis and another drifter named Yoichi clashed with unrelenting ferocity. Gilles, known for his immense physical strength, showcased his raw power by launching a series of brutal attacks. Yoichi, on the other hand, demonstrated remarkable agility and skill, evading Gilles' onslaught. He countered with a barrage of arrows, targeting vital spots in an attempt to bring Gilles down. Despite suffering numerous injuries, Gilles remained standing. His determination to continue his journey echoed Benkei's unwavering resolve. Observing the battle, Minamoto no Yoshitsune, another drifter, couldn't help but feel a surge of excitement at the spectacle unfolding before him. At the same time, Nobunaga, a charismatic and cunning leader among the drifters, seized the opportunity to educate the elves about the vulnerability of cavalry in a forest. He ordered the elves to eliminate the cavalry, and with ease, they executed his command. Back in the heart of the battle, Joan set the forest ablaze in her relentless pursuit of Toyohisa. However, Toyohisa executed a clever maneuver and appeared behind her. He skillfully cut off her escape routes, leaving her with no choice but to face him head on. Joan, unwavering in her determination, declared that Toyohisa would not escape her grasp. In a moment of quick thinking, Olminu created a protective wall behind Toyohisa. He ascended the barrier and with great agility, bit onto his sword. With precision and timing, Olminu erected a second wall atop the first, launching Toyohisa directly at Joan. His powerful kick sent her tumbling into a well, leaving Toyohisa with a sense of accomplishment. As Joan found herself trapped in the well, the sight of water brought back painful memories of her past. She had once been accused of witchcraft and had endured the agonizing flames of a burning at the stake. It was during this horrific ordeal that a mysterious figure named Easy had appeared and offered her a new path. Toyohisa, now realizing Joan's true identity as a woman, urged her to abandon her warrior's guise and embrace her femininity. Joan's response was one of anger and defiance. She explained that she had fought valiantly for France, but Toyohisa's blunt words struck a chord. In the end, he could not bring himself to take a woman's life. Turning his attention to the fallen Gilles de Rai, Toyohisa contemplated the importance of securing a worthy head for his cause. He couldn't face his father without proving his worth through a formidable adversary. In the midst of this intense battle, Yoichi continued to engage Gilles, managing to shoot him in the eye. Despite his injuries, Gilles refused to succumb to his wounds. In a desperate move, he caught Yoichi and began choking him with his chains. Nobunaga, ever the tactician, swiftly ordered the elves to target Gilles from behind. Despite the barrage of arrows, Gilles pressed on. Abe, a drifter, arrived on the scene with a group known as the Wild Bunch. He questioned Gilles, asking if he harbored hatred for the world. Gilles released Yoichi and turned his attention to Abe. Butch and Sundance, two members of the Wild Bunch, unleashed a barrage of gunfire upon Gilles, tearing through his body. Even with his lower half severed, Gilles continued to crawl toward his weapon. His thoughts turned to Joan and their shared fate, and he ultimately turned to Salt, dissolving into nothingness. Abe revealed himself as a drifter and declared his allegiance to Olmenu, leaving Nobunaga curious about this new addition to their group. Abe shared his name as Abe no Haruakara, solidifying his place among the drifters. The battle raged on, and the drifters and their allies stood victorious. Each member of this eclectic group brought their unique skills and experiences to the forefront, shaping the course of events in this mysterious world. In the aftermath of the conflict, the drifters found themselves facing not only external threats, but also internal questions about their their purpose, and the connections they had forged. As they navigated this unfamiliar world, they carried with them the weight of their own histories and the hope of finding a way back home. Minamoto no Yoshitsune, a warrior from the past, tells Yoichi that he's not doing his best and calls him a bit foolish for engaging in one-on-one -on -one combat. He playfully teases Yoichi for thinking he became a great warrior during the Genpei War and encourages him to remember his past deeds. Yoichi realizes that Yoshitsune is also in this world and firmly declares that he won't follow his orders anymore. Yoshitsune departs, promising a more exciting meeting in the future. As Abe no Haruakira reveals his name, Nobunaga inquires if he means Abe no Seimei, and Abe confirms this. Toyohisa, who is new to this world, arrives and admits he doesn't know who Seimei is. Abe explains that a mysterious man sent him and made him realize his mission is to stop the ends. Toyohisa mentions leaving a woman in a well, but upon inspection, she's vanished. Abe questions why he didn't eliminate her since she was an end. Toyohisa clarifies that he doesn't want to follow rigid rules and has no intention of taking a woman's life. He boldly states that they won't be pawns of the mysterious man. They're human beings who will stick to their principles. Olmenu asks about an elderly man, and Abe identifies him as Hannibal, who currently suffers from dementia. There was another man named Scipio, Hannibal's rival, 
who was clear-minded while traveling with them, but they encountered multiple attacks from the Black King's troops. Scipio fell from their carriage, and they couldn't search for him. Scipio finds himself lost in the forest, yearning to return to Rome and enjoy a bath. He stumbles upon Kano Naoshi's plane surrounded by beastmen. Naoshi, carried by the beastmen like a king, aggressively questions Scipio, assuming he's American. Scipio, unable to understand Naoshi's language, thinks he may be from an underdeveloped country. Scipio mentions Rome, which Naoshi connects to Italy's involvement in World War II. Naoshi acknowledges it, but remembers Italy's betrayal, and proceeds to attack Scipio. Sundance explains the functioning of empty cartridges to the group, and Nobunaga becomes immensely intrigued by the Gatling gun. Abe points out that they had researched gunpowder but couldn't manufacture the cartridges. Nobunaga reveals that they are already producing black powder, astonishing everyone. He explains that they are awaiting sulfur, which will Inu has arranged to obtain. Seimu arrives with the sulfur, and Nobunaga mentions their next move involves the dwarves. A starts to view Nobunaga as potentially dangerous, because drifters act according to their beliefs, and lack a common goal like the ends. He believes that the founder of Orte was a drifter who aimed to save the starving population, but it resulted in endless war. Abe inquires about Nobunaga's plans, and Nobunaga explains they will first free the dwarves, gradually liberate the tribes under Orte's control, establish alliances with other countries opposing Orte, and eventually overthrow Orte from within. They intend to unite the tribes, forming a multiracial federation where each race governs itself, with Toyohisa serving as the military leader and commander-in-chief. Abe questions why Nobunaga doesn't want to be king, and Nobunaga believes he's not suited for it. He realized that people's hearts don't respond to profit and fear, as he once thought. Toyohisa, despite his simplicity, needs assistance like Nobunaga. Toyohisa confronts Hannibal about his mental state, and Hannibal reminisces about Carthage and the invasion of Rome. Toyohisa charges at him with his sword, but Hannibal defensively points a stick at his eye, mistaking it for another Roman attack. Toyohisa notices that Hannibal is senile but still has some life in his eyes. He asks Olminu to look after Hannibal due to their shared eyes. Later, Toyohisa announces plans to free the dwarves to the elves, who express opposition. Shara explains that they have a history of conflict with the dwarves, who didn't aid them during an Orte attack. Toyohisa clarifies that participation is optional and only true soldiers should join. As Toyohisa departs alone, Nobunaga is annoyed that he's disrupting their plans. Shara reveals that their village will participate because Toyohisa saved their lives. He believes that if the dwarves and elves had united, they could have resisted Orte and avoided enslavement, preventing a repetition of past mistakes. Abe asks Toyohisa if he aims to change the world like Nobunaga, but Toyohisa asserts that he seeks heads, focusing on charging forward as a Satsuma warrior. Abe suggests returning to headquarters and searching for Scipio, but insists that Olminu accompany Toyohisa. The elves decide to join Toyohisa, and Butch gives a gun to Nobunaga, leaving him in charge of the Gatling gun, which is currently useless without bullets. In the midst of a fervent saga, the next strategic move of saint germain a formidable leader, unfolded as he set out with his steadfast companions Alesta and Flame. They embarked on a mission, eyeing the elves' location with calculated precision. There was a consensus among them that Godolka, Orte's heavily fortified armory, would likely be the next target. The liberation of dwarves held within its walls was a pivotal objective, one that could potentially tip the scales in their favor, spelling the downfall of Orte. In the heart of Godolka, the stronghold of weapons and armor for Orte's forces, a significant development was underway. A fresh shipment of weapons and armor arrived, signaling the intent to amplify the production of dwarven resources. This was a move evidently aimed at strengthening Orte's military might, reflecting the urgency in arming their troops for the impending battles. Amidst this strategic evolution, Nobunaga, known for his brilliant mind and tactical prowess, orchestrated an assault on Godolka. Armed with black powder and innovative bombs, he devised a plan to penetrate the defenses of the well-guarded armory. The explosions from the bombs, echoing the thunder boom induced panic and confusion within the ranks of the soldiers present. The chaos that ensued was amplified as the drifters artfully disguised themselves as soldiers, adding to the pandemonium and chaos unfurling within Godolka's walls. Leveraging this opportune moment, Toyohisa, a formidable warrior, and the elves surged forward, initiating an assault that was as strategic as it was bold. In the midst of the tumultuous setting, Olmenu, a proficient mage, showcased her skills in the realm of magic. With swift incantations and deft gestures, she summoned stone walls that rose, encircling and isolating the enemy troops from their heavily armored comrades. With the gates securely sealed, Nobunaga, always the tactician, grappled with the question of ingress into the castle. The key lay in Hannibal's symbolic hand signals, a subtle but critical clue. Realizing the significance of this nonverbal communication, Nobunaga adeptly directed Olminu and Yoichi. Through their coordinated efforts utilizing talismans, a stone staircase was conjured, providing a pathway into the fortress. Intrigued by the innovative means of communication facilitated by a magical sphere, Nobunaga, 
always forward-thinking, contemplated the strategic implications. He recognized the potential of instant messaging, a relatively unexplored concept in the realm of magic. This insightful perspective unveiled new vistas of strategic advantage, revolutionizing the way information could be shared and utilized in warfare. Within the walls of Gadolka, the scene was set for a face-off. Toyohisa and the elves encountered soldiers who had sought refuge behind a smaller gate. The elves, in an act of unity and strength, shared tales of the dwarves' fortitude, proposing a united effort to free them from their captors. The plight of the dwarves, subjected to deplorable treatment, stirred Toyohisa's sense of justice. He immediately extended a hand of aid, suggesting that they partake in a meal to regain their strength and vitality. In a bold yet strategic move, Toyohisa addressed the soldiers present, offering them a choice between surrender and facing dire consequences. The soldiers stood at a crossroads, with the weight of their decision bearing heavily on their minds. When their commander resisted, Toyohisa displayed the unflinching resolve of a leader, decisively beheading him, symbolizing the gravity of their situation. Meanwhile, Octobrist, an observant figure from a distance, kept a watchful eye on the developments surrounding the enigmatic Black King. They noted the presence of the Bronze Dragon and a host of awe-inspiring creatures engaged in seemingly ordinary tasks like farming. This unexpected sight unveiled a layer of complexity to the Black King's motivations, proving Abe's insights right. The Black King harbored intentions beyond sheer destruction intending to be the savior of monsters, replacing humanity as their guardian. This revelation underscored the intricate nature of the end's motivations, casting a mysterious veil over the unfolding narrative. The Bronze Dragon engages in a conversation with the Black King, expressing annoyance that the Black King has tamed the Winged Dragons and is treating them like pets. As the Bronze Dragon issues threats, the Black King employs his healing power, causing cancerous cells to appear all over the Bronze Dragon's body, compelling him to join their side. The Black King then utilizes his abilities to replicate crops. Toshizo questions why the Black King is teaching the creatures to farm when he could easily replicate food. The Black King clarifies that he's not a deity and doesn't possess eternal life. He turns to Grigori Rasputin, who explains that they're prepared and have created their own writing system and symbols for their religion. At the castle overseeing the elven colonies, Mills receives word of an approaching carriage. Seeing that it's saint germy he hastily instructs elven boys to hide. saint germy and his entourage express frustration at the absence of male elves and express a desire to meet them and the drifters. However, Mills informs them that the drifters have gone to free the dwarves to help produce firearms. saint germy then inquires about black powder, and Mills confirms that they are already manufacturing it. Upon hearing this, saint germy realizes that Orte is in dire straits. After a continuous feast, the dwarves have regained their strength and express curiosity about the musket Nobunaga mentioned. They're uncertain about what it is, but upon seeing it, they consider it easy to replicate. The dwarves and Yoichi wonder why they would need it when they already have bows. Toyohisa explains that the musket's roar serves as a battle cry, making it easier to teach a peasant to kill a soldier. At the northern walls, Joan of Arc awakens to an annoyed Anastasia, who has been tasked with watching over her. Upon learning her location, Joan urgently inquires about Gilles de Reis, to which Anastasia bluntly informs her of his death. Joan expresses a fervent desire to avenge him and her past losses, vowing to kill the drifters this time. Anastasia, even more irritated, intervenes to prevent Joan's impulsive actions. She chastises Joan for her recklessness and underestimation of their adversaries, which led to her prior defeats. Anastasia conveys that she has been ordered to recover and await further instructions from the Black King. Alone and infuriated, Joan seethes over being commanded by her rival and swears to exact revenge on Toyohisa for humiliating her. Rasputin and Anastasia discuss Toyohisa, with Rasputin and expressing doubts about the samurai going easy on Joan because she's a woman, while Anastasia believes that he merely held back at the last moment. She speculates that Toyohisa wants to face Joan again despite the threat she poses, indicating he shouldn't be underestimated. Anastasia also expresses disdain at the notion of samurai descendants defeating their country in her era. In an attempt to lighten the mood, Rasputin playfully suggests that Joan's defeat upset Anastasia, annoying the Grand Duchess who departs not in the mood for jests. Meanwhile, the bronze dragon is restrained and injured, pleading with with the Black King to cease the torture. However, the Black King insists that if the Bronze Dragon can't walk with them, he's merely meat. A part of the Black King falls off, but he warns a kobold, who witnessed it not to speak of it. Easy sends another person, annoyed with Murasaki, and commenting that he stands no chance against her. Minamoto no Yoshitsune encounters the man and ponders whether he's an end or a drifter. The dwarves inform Nobunaga that the blacksmiths who made the musket are skilled, but no match for them. They hand Nobunaga the first musket, saying that after the initial creation, subsequent ones will be faster. Nobunaga contemplates how many they can produce, and the dwarves suggest they could make seven to eight, eventually reaching ten per day. 
Elsewhere, the dwarves showcase their capabilities as soldiers. Alesta and Flame arrive, surprised that an alliance with the dwarves has already been established. Saint Germy expresses astonishment that a musket has already been created. Olminu appears and inquires whether Saint Germy is a drifter or an end, to which he identifies as a drifter as no end like him can exist. She questions the reason for creating Orte, and Saint-Germy shares that Orte was once a great empire, and he mentions that Adolf Hitler, a drifter, created a successful system and government. Nobunaga recognizes that Saint-Germy possesses significant knowledge about them. Saint-Germy reveals he's there to assess whether it's worthwhile to join forces with them. Alesta suddenly attacks Toyohisa making a remark about how Toyohisa would be to his liking in 30 years. However, when Alesta sees Hannibal, his disposition completely changes because Hannibal is more to his taste. Flame becomes upset about the situation with Alesta. Flame states that unless a boy with a ponytail and an eye band appears, they won't be able to attract him the same way. Yet Yoichi arrives, and Flame finds himself in a similar situation as Alesta. Shortly after, San Jeremy informs Nobunaga that his expert men are evaluating Toyohisa, but they return battered and beaten. San Jeremy reveals that one of them is a traitor and has come to sell Orte. As the unfolding narrative surged with intensity, the drifters found themselves in the heart of Orte's capital, Verlina. Upon their arrival, a vigilant soldier halted San Jeremy's carriage, demanding to know their identities. Alesta swiftly intervened, asserting their importance and threatening to reassign the soldier to the perilous front lines for daring to obstruct Saint Germy's path. Earlier, in a moment of curiosity, Saint Germy had inquired about the drifters' names, recognizing Toyohisa from the Battle of Sekigahara and Yoichi from the Genpei War. The drifters were somewhat astonished by Saint Germy's fame, especially Nobunaga, who was deemed super famous in the eyes of Saint Germy. However, the enigmatic Hannibal remained a mystery, dubbed simply as the Raspberry Man due to his unfamiliar name. Intriguingly, the drifters discerned that Saint Germy hailed from a time even later than their own. The conversation took a turn, with Saint Germy offering Toyohisa insights into the historical events yet to unfold, including potential strategies to subdue Tokugawa. Toyohisa, confident in his knowledge, assured San Germy that he was already aware of the future outcomes. San Germy, an influential figure with significant sway, orchestrated a bold move by gathering Orte's leaders and boldly announcing the shutdown of the nation. He reclaimed the country he had lent to them 50 years prior, intending to usher in a new era with Toyohisa at the helm. While some leaders sided with Saint Germy's vision for change, others revealed their allegiance to the puppeteer Rasputin, an insidious force manipulating the situation from behind the scenes. Upon entering the capital, Toyohisa and his companions found themselves in the midst of a meeting disrupted by Rasputin's controlled soldiers. Swift and decisive, Toyohisa quashed the threat with lethal precision. Rasputin was left astounded and humiliated, his plans foiled by the merciless leader Toyohisa. This unexpected turn of events allowed the drifters to manipulate the narrative, positioning themselves as saviors, liberating Orte from the clutches of the ends. As the battle ensued, Nobunaga and Saint Germy engaged in a spirited argument, addressing the unexpected scale of the conflict. Saint Germy's sacred band of Thebes, a formidable group of topless, muscular warriors, joined their ranks. Amidst the chaos, Toyohisa devised a strategic plan, assigning leadership roles to Nobunaga, himself, and Yoichi, respectively. They anticipated a change in the enemy's tactics, shifting their approach to wreak maximum destruction and chaos. When the battle erupted, Nobunaga issued orders to fire, introducing the enemy to the terrifying force of firearms. The front line was decimated, and Toyohisa valiantly charged into battle alongside his men. Meanwhile, Toshizo, observing the chaos unfolding, harbored anger at the sight of a Shimazu. The battlefield was a cauldron of fury and strategy, where the fate of Orte hung precariously in the balance. In this intense, ever-evolving tale, the clash of strategies, personalities, and destinies reached a boiling point. The drifters and their newfound allies stood united against an encroaching darkness, prepared to face the trials that lay ahead in their quest to reshape the world and thwart the end's sinister designs. The outcome of this monumental conflict remained uncertain, with each chapter promising new revelations and uncharted territories. In the tumultuous chaos of battle, Toyohisa Shimazu, accompanied by a battalion of fierce dwarves, forged forward with ferocious determination, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. Simultaneously, Nobunaga Oda, a masterful tactician, issued swift commands to Yoichi, instructing him to maintain a relentless barrage, shattering the enemy's rear guard. Across the battlefield, Hijikata Toshizo, a formidable opponent hailing from a distinct era, orchestrated a strategic retreat for his forces, utilizing smoke to obscure vision and employing a ruthless tactic of burning houses to disrupt their adversaries' movements. Nobunaga, ever observant, deduced the enemy leader's astute understanding of warfare and the tactical deployment of firearms, signifying a level of strategic prowess that demanded respect and caution. As the battles raged on, 
Amidst the cacophony of clashing blades and the roar of firearms, Toshizo seized an opportune moment to engage Toyohisa in combat. Introducing himself as Hijikata Toshizo from the Shinsengumi, he harbored deep-seated animosity towards the Shimazu clan. The clash between the two warriors was fierce and unrelenting, with Toshizo employing his formidable powers to create illusions of Shinsengumi members intending to overpower Toyohisa. In the midst of their skirmish, Toyohisa cleverly used plates to disrupt Toshizo's attacks, frustrating and enraging his opponent. Despite suffering wounds in the battle, Toyohisa displayed resilience and determination that exceeded Toshizo's expectations. In the broader scheme of the battlefield, the strategic genius of Nobunaga came into play. He observed a discernible pattern in the enemy's movements as they set fires, converging towards the capital building. This realization allowed him to craft a cunning plan, Nobunaga ordered their forces to lure the enemy into the capital building and then set it ablaze. Olminu's magical prowess would seal the building, trapping the adversaries inside, effectively incapacitating them, and shifting the advantage back into their favor. While Toyohisa fought valiantly, Toshizo's smoke-filled illusions and relentless attacks began to take a toll on him. However, Toyohisa's unwavering spirit and determination stood firm, refusing to concede to defeat. He fought with every ounce of strength, determined to honor the trust and reliance placed upon him by his comrades. Meanwhile, the enigmatic Black King, a figure shrouded in mystery and authority, acknowledged the success of the probing assault and the crippling blow dealt to Orte. His actions and foresight extended beyond mere destruction, showcasing a strategic mindset focused on achieving their ultimate objective. In the aftermath of the battle, Rasputin, a manipulative puppeteer orchestrating chaos from behind the scenes, apologized for the loss of his army. However, the Black King reassured him that their sacrifices had not been in vain, yielding a significant outcome in this probing assault and inflicting substantial damage upon Orte. As the battle subsided and the dust settled, a new revelation came to light. A man sent by Easy was revealed to be Akechi Mitsuhide, a historical figure infamous for his role in betraying Oda Nobunaga during the Sengoku period. His arrival and alignment with the Black King hinted at a deeper vendetta, driven by a burning desire for revenge against Nobunaga. That's all for today's journey into the fascinating world of Drifters. We hope you've enjoyed this recap as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. See you in the next recap video.